Happy Father's Day to all the dads in the house. We love you. Looking across this room, both these gatherings, Cumberland and here, there are some of the best dads on the planet at Passion City Church. And we just applaud you. We celebrate you. We honor you today. The legacy that you're leaving, not only in your kids, but through your kids, that's the beauty. To raise up kids that can be difference makers in a generation is what it's all about. So we applaud you, celebrate you today. And uh, man, what an amazing thought for all of us just to think about our dads today. Anybody think about your dad every day? Anybody named after your dad? Any guys in the house named after dad? Any of the ladies in the house named after your dad? That's cool too, right? Deva. I'm, I'm the third. Louis F. Giglio, I'm going to hold on to my middle name for now if you don't know it. I'll have to Google it. Um, you can Google it right now. Just take you 10 seconds. Louis Floyd Giglio the third. That's a big name. That's a really big name. But for most of my life, that wasn't my name. See, I've got a pretty big reputation, especially in Marietta, Georgia. Here I am in 1976 in the Marietta Daily Journal. This is uh, your pastor um, over here. Yeah. I'm the one on the right in case you're like still struggling trying to figure that out. And yes, that's all natural. That's no perm going on right there. That's the real thing. And it says, meet CHSS Campbell High School Court Specialist. This is talking about how how great a doubles team we were and our plans were to go to Georgia State together and be one of the first high school doubles teams to specialize in doubles in college tennis. If you want to know who who is talking about, just zoom in on the byline up there at the top, Ray Dukes and Butch Giglio. Okay, some of you know me from back in the day. A few folks are here from Campbell High School today, and some of you know me from old First Baptist days. My sister's over here. Of course, she knows me from back in the day, and everybody from back in the day still kind of jokingly calls me Butch occasionally, because for a large portion of my life, that was my identity. Now, this whole article happened, and I was digging around for that photo I wanted to show you, and I found this other one, though, and I just want to read this because it made me feel good last night. Marietta Net team has devil of a time. Isn't that a great headline right there? It's the Marietta High School Blue Devils, if you didn't know. And uh, I want you to zoom in on the paragraph that I apparently have taken a red pencil and uh, highlighted for myself as a high school senior. The number one doubles for boys, and the number one doubles for boys, I, I thought we were more like men, but hey, I'll take boys. The Campbell team of Ray Dukes and Butch Giglio. Now here comes your operative word. Finally put everything together in good working order and rolled to a 6-3, 6-2 victory over the Wheeler team. Are you here today, Neil? Neil Martin or, or Jim McCartney, are you here? This was so great, people. Wheeler was where all the rich kids went. Wheeler High School. I don't know what Wheeler's like right now, but back in the day, it was like all the country club kids. They all had private tennis coaches. They all had the nicest tennis outfits. They all had the coolest rackets you could afford. I was scrapping down at Campbell High School in Smyrna, Georgia, living in an apartment complex, and we had Zippo. I couldn't afford the Arthur Ashe composite head racket that Ray Dukes could afford. No, I had the the head professional, the red little throat because that's all we could afford in our family. So Campbell High School taking on the rich kids at Wheeler High School in the rich kids sport. Can we see it again? (laughs) For a 6-3, 6-2, two-set sweep over the rich kids at Wheeler, Neil Martin and Jim McCartney, the Dukes Giglio duo has been one of the top teams in every meet, but here it comes again. And finally, anybody feeling there's a finally over your life today coming? It's coming. You can see it out there in the distance. You're believing for it. Your parents are praying for it. One of these days, it's coming. Well, it came for us. Finally, 
We picked up the overall win it deserved, thank you very much, in the finals of the county meet, their last high school tournament as a team. Yeah. Now, almost true because we won the region tournament and went to state, thank you very much. They're like, man, you got a lot of press time. Yeah, I could have brought a whole lot more clippings out of the Marietta Daily Journal because we were a big deal or because Ray Duke's mom worked for the Marietta <laughs> Daily Journal. <laughs> oh, we were in the paper every week. <laughs> Butch Giglio. I don't know how it went down. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you know the story, but... People sitting around Georgia Baptist Hospital, Martha, Jean, and Louie, they have little baby boy and Louie Sr. still alive at the time, Louie Jr., my dad's still alive, and they're like, I don't know, we don't know what we're going to do with this kid. We got three of them now, we don't know what to do. I know, let's call the kid Butch. And if you're a Butch here today, God bless you, but in my mind, when I think about Butch, I, I think about the opposite of that scrawny kid you saw in that photograph, about 90 pounds going into the, my senior year of high school. Butch, to me, is driving a dually. You know what I'm talking about? One of those trucks with the extra tires on the back that doesn't fit in the parking space. Got a, a crew cut, probably. Buff. Beat some people up along the way. Butch. I'm not thinking that's the scrawny little kid with the funny last name, like me in the froed out hair trying to make it as a, a doubles team, but that was, the, that was the label on my life. Butch, Jew. And then one day everything changed. Graduated Campbell High School, did go to Georgia State along with my specialist doubles partner, Ray Dukes. One of us did play collegiate tennis at Georgia State University. That would be Ray Dukes. One of us did not. I went on to grad school in Fort Worth, Texas, sat in my desk in one of the first classes I was in in grad school. And in grad school, they did the same thing that they had done in grade school. Day one, we're gonna call the roll. I mean, it's just a thing. We do it in second grade, we do it in grad school. Gonna go down the roll, gonna get down to the G's. I'm already knowing what's gonna happen because it's happened to me every elementary class, every middle school class, every high school class, every class at Georgia State. We're gonna get down around to the G's now and there's gonna be a long pause while the professor looks at this name and goes, huh. I don't know, Giglio looks pretty simple to me. It's just six letters, a lot of vowels, I know, but it looks pretty straightforward. But in the pause, I would always speak up. It's uh, Louis Giglio, and I go by Butch. I did that in third grade. I did that in fifth grade class. I did it in eighth grade class, 12th grade class. I did it sophomore year, college. I did it uh, when I failed out and went to Kennesaw for a little while, and I did it when I came back to Georgia State. I'll always, Louis Giglio, I go by Butch. I go by Butch. I go by Butch. I go by Butch until we got to this class. We're sitting in Fort Worth, Texas. We're miles away from home, but I did have a buddy that I grew up with and, uh, and went to church youth group with all the way through some of the late high school and college sitting right across the aisle from me, but it came down to the big pause, and I went, it's Louis Giglio, and they I said, Louis Giglio, and I said, here. My friend looks across the aisle at me like, you can't do that. You can't like change your name right here in Old Testament history. <laughs> I was like, oh yes, I can. Because I'm not changing my name, I'm claiming my name. I'm grabbing back onto what my actual name is. And my name is Louis Giglio here. It just seemed more fitting to me. I mean, when you think Butch, you're thinking good old boy. When you're thinking Louis, you're thinking king, right? You're thinking <laughs> royalty. You're thinking like... European powerhouse. You're thinking about something that goes with Giglio or Giglio as it's pronounced. You're thinking, this is who I think I'm supposed to be. And I just raised my hand one day and I said, here, uh, end of that year at grad school, I met Shelly. Hi, I'm Louie. Six months later, she came to visit in Atlanta. Man, she freaked out totally and completely rolling into town. Oh, we're so glad you and Butch are dating. No, I'm not dating Butch. I don't know any Butches and I'm definitely not dating anybody named Butch. My mom called me Butch until, I mean, to the late stages of her life, she was calling me Butch. Andy Stanley still on occasion calls me Butch. 
switch now. It was just a thing. And Shelly's rolling into town like, what is up with the butch situation? I'm like, yeah, it was a thing. But you're dating Louie. And you're going forward with Louie. Because that's my name. I believe today that God wants you to know your name. Because it is amazing to me how we end up living with different names put on our lives. That regional tournament where uh, we did finally get it all together, (laughs) finally measured up to our potential, finally won some big tournament, my dad shows up. My dad had never watched me play a competitive tennis match in my high school career. We came from a working class family, not like the Wheeler kids, whose dads, I guess, own their own businesses and could show up at two o'clock to watch a tennis tournament on a Thursday afternoon. We came from a working class family. My dad couldn't just bust away from the office in the middle of the afternoon to drive somewhere up into Cobb County and to watch the boy play. But all of a sudden, we're in the middle of the first set against these Wheeler cats, and I'm serving. And I'm bouncing the ball, no kidding, getting ready to serve. And as I look out of the corner of my eye, the tennis center at this maybe 30 court tennis complex is right there with the steps coming down to to our court. So I'm just look right there and standing against the wall at the tennis center is my dad. And I'm like, oh, (laughs) my dad has never come to watch. I don't think my dad has ever even seen me play tennis before. I've been playing tennis hours a day for years. And there's my dad. And I'm just like, okay, a few more extra bounces right here. Because my dad just showed up and my dad calls me ace. And that's what I'm about to do to Jim McCartney over there. I'm about to ace him right now. I'm about to give him some of the business right now and show my dad what is up. I'm not playing golf like I should be, Dad, but I'm playing tennis, and I'm going to show you why. Get ready for this. I wish I had the composite racket, but we couldn't afford it in our family. But I got this guy, and I'm about to punch this boy out. And I mean, it was just like, get ready. Man, and I smashed it right into the bottom of the net. (laughs) But oh, don't you worry. I've got a spin kick second serve. Going to drive homeboy into the chain link fence with this. Are you ready? So, I mean, I reach back. I've got the toss right. The ball's behind me. I've got the spin coming down. And I mean, I, now dad was really impressed because I hit the ball almost in the air all the way to the back fence. <laughs> fault, double fault. Okay, it's all right. I got another, I got another point. I'm probably bounced the ball th- 300 times on this one. And I had a prayer service and a revival meeting with the Lord in the process of that, reminding him of all the things I had done for him in my life, asking him just this one time, please, I'll never ask you for anything else again. Please just let me get this over the net. I want to say conservatively, just since we're being transparent and now that you know I'm butch, I double faulted probably a dozen times in that match. That's brutal. Some point I looked up, my dad was gone. He had to go back to work. And so I'm like, oh my, but we win. Thank you, Ray Dukes. <laughs> so I get home later that night, walk into our apartment. My dad, it's maybe 6.30 at night. Dad's been home a little while, walked through the front door. He goes, hey, how'd it turn out? Kind of like, I know how it turned out, you know, but I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna ask anyway. How did it turn out? I said, well, we won. We're going to state. And he goes, well, that's good news. And he goes, I don't know about, to, you know, I always have called you Ace, but I think, I think you got a new name today. I think your new name is Double Fault. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, love you too, Dad. Walk down the hall to my room. And I got to tell you the honest truth, that stung a little bit. Oh, it's not like groundbreaking, relationship-breaking material. I get that. But if I, if I went, I don't play uh, tennis anymore, but if I went and played like just hanging around, played a match with you right now, and we just decided to go out and play for fun, but we were keeping score, and, and we, I got ready to serve, I, I'm not making this up right now. I'm 60 years old, 
and I, I probably do need to go see somebody about it, but I, if, I, if I were serving right now in the middle of the afternoon, just minding my own business, about four bounces in, do you know what would come through my mind? My dad standing in the den of our apartment saying, I'm going to give you a new name starting today. It's double fault. And I'd be sitting there going, don't double fault. Whatever you do, don't double fault. Just get this one in. I think that's why I quit playing tennis. I mean, it just was so hard to get the ball in when your name is double fault. And those little layers, the names were given. And then the names that are added on in the course of our lives shape our identity. And I would love today just to take a moment and ask God if he could peel back for you and me, what is your identity? Not like when you're reaching down for your driver's license and yes, I have my ID or you're pulling your passport out. I've got my ID. But in your mind and in your heart, what is your identity and where did you get it? Because I believe today God wants to speak something over our lives that could potentially change everything. We sang together both locations today a song. And in that song were seven words. And those seven words that we sang, many of us in the room believing the seven words we sang. Those seven words have the potential to change everything in our lives. I want you to look with me in the Gospel of Matthew at an encounter that happened between one of Jesus' followers and himself. Now, all the followers were there. All the disciples were there. They'd come to a place called Caesarea Philippi. We've talked about it at Passion City before. It was a very sacred site in the day and time of Jesus. Not as a site of worship to the one true God that we worship today, but a God of the nations, the Romans and the Greeks revered this place, particularly for the god Pan. Little g-o-d, God, Pan. Pan was the god of everything. In other words, uh, the tree was God, and the sky was God, and you're God, and I'm God, and everything is God. And there was a cave and this big, huge rock outcropping. And in the cave was a whirlpool where if you threw this table into it, it would literally disappear and never come back up. And what people believed about this sacred site was that this was where the waters went down into the depths of the earth to appease and satisfy the gods. And so they would bring their offerings, even some, I know it sounds crazy, would bring their offspring and throw their offering into the waters. And down into the waters it would go, whatever they brought. And they would believe in their heart that somehow what I brought has gone down into the depths and appeased the gods. And people would flock from all over the Middle East to this place, Caesarea Philippi. So we pick up the story, and this is what we find, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, just a footnote there, Jesus isn't afraid of the culture and the conversation. In fact, he's always gonna show up and the culture and in the conversation. He is not about cloistering himself somewhere going, well, they all believe in that and they all believe in that and everybody seems to be flocking that direction and everybody seems to be thinking that way. No, he shows up in the middle of it all. He shows up at this place where worship is happening left and right. Crowds are flocking from a distance uh, in, in every direction and he shows up there now with his followers And this conversation unfolds. He asks his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, we know who they say Pan is, but who do they say the Son, capital, of Man is? So he's already kind of answering the question by saying, I'm different. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. You sound like that guy who came crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. You do these miracles kind of like Elisha was doing when he called down the fire on Mount Carmel. People think maybe Elisha's come back into the story, but then he narrows the question, but what about you? Who do you say that I am. That's the defining question, by the way, that he wants to bring into your life today. Not, hey, a bunch of people came to church and everybody has an opinion, but what do you think about Jesus? But he doesn't just leave you in a vacuum. But Peter pipes up. 
Verse 16, Simon Peter, two-name guy, answered, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And that was the right answer. Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon, notice he only picks one of his two names, son of Jonah, brings his dad in on the story. For this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Now, something very important is happening here that all of us need to understand today. God wants you to walk out of this building today with a clear understanding of who he says that you are. He wants you to be able to root your identity, not in a name or a label that was put on you, but in the identity that Christ has birthed in you. And he wants you to walk out and live out of your true God-given identity today. But before that can happen, there has to be a true view of who God is. So you just can't make up the God that you want there to be and then expect to find freedom in that God's view of you. Freedom is found when your eyes are open like Peter's eyes were open, not revealed by flesh and blood. You didn't work this out on your own. My father revealed this to you. My father opened your eyes to see who I am. So when we have our eyes open to truly see who God is, then we find freedom in seeing that the true God sees us as we are. So it starts and is connected to an understanding of who God is that then dominoes into an awakening as to who that God says that we are. And those two powerful forces working together are gonna unlock for you a brand new future where you can throw off the labels of the past and live as God says that you are in this moment and as God says that you can be in your life. So he says, this wasn't revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And then look, look at what he says in, verse, in the next verse coming down to verse 18. And I tell you that you are Peter. Now do you see what's happening here? Simon Peter, when Jesus meets Simon Peter, in the very first moment, calls him as a disciple. You can find this in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 42. He says, your name is Simon, but they're going to call you Cephas, which is just the language of the day for the name Peter. Your name is Simon, but they're going to call you Peter. It's like Jesus shows up, and immediately in the conversation, he wants to define a new identity for Peter. In the very first day, He's already saying, I see something different for your life. And so he says that again here. Simon, good answer. Good answer, son of Jonah. Simon, amazing. And then he says, your name is Peter. Peter meaning little rock, Petros. Your name is little rock. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Now, I just want you to understand the context here. He's not saying, and on this little rock called Petros, Peter, I'm going to build the whole great church of the kingdom. That wouldn't make any sense. He said on your statement, I am the Christ, the son of the living God. That was true. And on that rock, what rock? The Christ, the son of the living God. The rock, the, the rock of ages, if you will, the cornerstone of cornerstones, if you will. On me, Peter, I'm going to build a church, and the gates of Hades are not going to prevail against it. But notice the freedom and the invitation. He said, you're a little rock. Can't build a whole church on you. I'm a big rock, going to build a whole church on me. But guess what? I'm inviting you, little rock, to be a part of what I'm building on the big rock. You are going to have the keys of the kingdom. You're going to be able to loose things and bind things in the authority and the power of the name of Jesus. You're going to be a player, Peter. You're going to be in the story, Peter. You've got a future and you've got a destiny with me. The church is going to be built on me and the church is going to prevail at the end of the day. But Peter, you're going to be in the story with me. Are you listening? That's what Simon means, listening. You're a rock in my story. Are you listening, Simon? You are going to be a stone in the kingdom work of Almighty God. And I'm going to build up this church with you. I'm choosing you. When Jesus said that, he was being prophetic. 
What does prophetic mean? It means when people speak into your life truth based on the finished work of Jesus that hasn't been actualized or visualized completely in the present, but they are speaking in faith the truth that Christ has accomplished for your life, even though it all hasn't come to be in this present moment. And he spoke over Peter, I'm calling you, I'm choosing you, I'm defining you, and I'm shaping you. Are you listening, Simon? You're gonna be a little stone in the work of God. And that's what God wants to do in your life today. He wants to prophesy over you. Speak over you the reality that God sees for your life, even though all of that reality may not have been actualized in this present moment. So that there will be a day when the story is written about you and she finally put it all together and has stepped up into the destiny that God had spoken into and over her life. I don't know where your identity is rooted today. I think when you look around, it's pretty clear that our identity is rooted in a few places. Number one, in our position. In fact, you just listen to people. So what do you do? I'm a teacher. What do you do? I'm a doctor. What do you do? I'm, a, I'm an IT guy. I'm a conflict resolution person. I'm a, I'm a mom. I'm a whatever. That's what I do. That's my identity. That's who I am. We, we just lead with our position. So for me, I'm a preacher. I have a public platform. People know who I am. I, I go to places. I open the word of God. I speak to people. I'm an author. I'm a pastor. I'm a co-founder of a movement. And that's the way I get introduced places. And that's my bio. And, and, and that's my position. But do you understand if you have a position like that or whatever your position is, how easy it is to blur your identity with your position? And to all, all of a sudden believe that you are the position and forget that you are the person. I mean, it's Father's Day today and fathers and mothers are trapped into this. I mean, mom, think about you. You say, well, well who are you? I'm, I'm just a mom. What do you do? I'm a mom. I'm a mom, I'm a mom, I'm a mom. That's what I do, I'm a mom. And God is wanting to break in today with a big news story. Your identity, mom, is not mom. You're like, whoa. Oh, 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 yes it is. Louis, my husband actually is calling me mom now. <laughs> I'm pretty much mom. And God is going, no, you are a mom, but your identity is not rooted in mom. That's your position. I think our gifting is where we get our identity. What we're good at is what people think we are. I think our, our failures shape our identity. Oh, you're a three-time, oh, she's, you know, she, she's, my, you know, my, 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 my other sister, you know, the one that's the recovering, our failures, our feelings shape our identity. I mean, we wake up in the morning and we are what we feel we are that day. But you know what else shapes our identity? Others. Other people put labels on us and shape our identity. And the crazy thing, I think, in light of the gospel is that we let them do it. We actually give people way more permission than we should. And, and all through our lives, whether it's an ex-boss or an ex or a business partner or it was a teacher or a coach or a neighbor or somebody we were close friends with in another time or somebody that we went to class with or whoever, it's amazing to me how willing we are to say to people, hey, could you, would you mind just taking a minute and just, just maybe writing down a few things that, about me? And, and we just are like, oh yeah, I, I used to be... I used to, to know this person and we, we you know, had a thing or whatever and they have an opinion. It's almost like with the social media craziness that we're living in, every time we make a post, every time we make a post, we're basically handing a pen and a piece of paper to our world and saying, please comment. And, and please, please like, please, please like, 
Yeah, you have to take the lid off before I you can do that. Please like. Heart. Thank you. And please comment. And please tell me that I look good. Oh, girl, you look good. Oh, bro, you've been, you were cut. Whoa, you've been working out. Man, that is a good looking outfit. Your hair. I mean, I, I don't look around on Instagram a lot, but every now and then you do. And I mean, you just read down through the comments, it's like, fire. Fire, man, you look like fire. Girl, you look like fire. Please comment and tell me that I'm a good mom. I have my kids out at the park. They're all dressed. I have snacks. No one has been injured in this event. Please comment. Please comment. Please tell me I'm a good dad. You know, all the other dads are playing golf. I met my little girl's ballet recital. Comment, please. Man, what a good dad. What an amazing father. How awesome are you? And then some joker comes on there. Says, <clears throat> you know that little emoji? Uh, <clears throat> shorts, shorts. Are you at that concert? Please, just a sentence or two. Thank you. <laughs> you, you, you don't like me? Listen, I'm telling you, before God Almighty, we are giving the world way too much power over who we are. We are giving people, some of whom we don't even know that well, way too much power over our lives. Please like it and leave a comment. And please leave a good comment and tell me I'm a boss. Tell me I look good. Tell me I lost weight. Tell me I'm doing the right thing. Tell me you think I'm cool. Tell me you think I'm a somebody. And we let our position, our gifts, our failures, our feelings define us. And we let other people define us. And somebody put a double fault over your life somewhere. And here you are all these years later. And you're still bouncing the ball. And you're still replaying the label that they put on your life. And it is a danger game. It is a tightrope over the grain. Canyon. Because if your position, your success is where you get your ID, then you are not sleeping good at night trying to figure out how to stay on that tightrope because you don't know who you'd be if you didn't win. And if you're all about living out the failures of your past, then you're just trying to stay on the tightrope because you already crashed and burned once and you're not sure you can survive doing it again. I tell you, our ID also gets shaped by the enemy. Oh, he'll leave a comment. And he's got like video evidence to back it up. Loser, failure, defective, sinner, horrible, guilty. And then I think sometimes the worst definer of, it, of all of it is ourselves. And we just sit there going, man, I'm a mess up. I don't know why. I just, I'm a, nobody even honestly knows I'm here. I think if I dropped off the planet today, it wouldn't even be fully realized that I was gone until somewhere in 2023. I know I don't get it right. In fact, I don't even want to get it right half the time. and we define. But there's another way, and it's these seven words. I am who you say I am. 
I'm not what my position says I am. I'm not what my gifting says I am. I'm not what my failures or my feelings say I am. I'm not what Joe Blow on the street says I am. I'm definitely not what the devil says I am. And I'm not even most of the time what I say I am. You know what I am? I am who you say I am. And I believe God is saying to us today, do you know who I say that you are? Are you listening, Simon? You're a little rock in a great story of God, and I'm going to use you. I'm prophesying over you today. I'm going to use you. And no, you do not have it all together right now. We're reading Matthew 16, and he says, you're Peter, you're a little rock, and on this big rock, I'm going to build the kingdom, and I'm going to do great things. Three verses later, three verses later, he calls Peter Satan. He went from Simon to Peter to Satan in three verses because he messes up. He doesn't get it. And Jesus says, I'm going to give my life for the sins of the world. He goes, oh, not on my watch here, not because I'm little Peter, the little rock, and I'm going to do some great things here. And one of the great things I'm going to do here is keep you from going through that. And Jesus said, you know, get behind me, Satan, because I got a purpose and a plan that's going to save the world. And it's going to be the pathway by which I give people a brand new identity. And you know what the identity is going to be? Sons and daughters born again to a brand new relationship with God as a perfect heavenly father. And that is the identity that God is speaking into our lives today. A couple of quick texts, just reading them together because I want you to see who God says that you are. First John chapter three, I love this. First John chapter three, verse one. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. So we're not making this up today. This is a result of God's love in Christ. And that is what we are. Now, it's not all full measure yet. We see that. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But check this out. There's going to be a finally moment coming, like a big finally moment. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's the prophetic word of God over your life today. You are a loved son right now. That's why you're different, because your father's different. So you can stop trying to blend in and actually take joy in standing out. And there's coming a day when it all comes together and in the twinkling of an eye, you're gonna see him and actually our bodies are going to be made new like our spirit have already been made new and we're gonna be like him. Colossians 3 verse 12, he's calling us by different names than the enemy wants to call us and by the world standards. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, So just like when he said to Simon, I want you to focus on being Peter, he's saying to you, I don't know what has been spoken over your life, but I want you to know what's going to be spoken over your life. I'm choosing you. Oh, I'm going to call you Satan in three verses, but I'm choosing you. Oh, you're going to deny me three times a few chapters later, but I'm choosing you. Yes, you're going to fail, but I'm choosing you because I'm going to restore you back at that breakfast on the beach after the resurrection. Peter's back fishing and Jesus meets him and some of the other disciples, calls them in from the lake. He's prepared fish for breakfast on the shore. And finally, he has this moment with Peter and he says, hey, a couple questions for you really quick. And you know what he calls him? He says, Simon, do you love me? So, you know, we kind of moved on to Peter, but after that denying me three times saying, we're going to move back to Simon for a minute. Are you listening? Simon, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Thank you for giving me this shot. Yes, 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 I do love you. Feed my sheep. Simon, let me ask you one more time. Do you love me? Yes! 
Someone will ask you a third time, do you really love me? I really love you. Great. Remember the Simon Peter moment, Caesarea Philippi? You're going to be a part of this great thing that I'm going to do. That's what I want you to focus on. Not the failure and not the past. I want you to focus on the future and how I'm choosing you and appointing you. You get to feed my sheep. A denier of me gets to feed my sheep. Someone who broke down on me in my biggest moment of need, I'm choosing you to lead forth the cause to tell the world about who I am. He says, you are therefore God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. So clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. And forgive as the Lord forgave you. And then Romans 8, this powerful text, beautiful in what it says about how we have been made new by the Spirit of Christ. In verse 15, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. Amen? But you received the spirit of sonship. That word sonship means of adoption. You received the spirit of being adopted into the family of God so that now by him, who's the him? By that spirit, by the spirit of God that was given to us when we put our faith in Christ, by that spirit we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is the New Testament word in the Aramaic language that Jesus would have spoken. It's what a little kid would have yelled in the streets when his dad came home from work. Abba, 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 Abba. So he's taking the almighty and the infinite God and putting down on a level that you and I can put our arms around. And he says, when you trust in Christ, his spirit, the spirit comes into our spirits and the spirit of God in us affirms to us, I have a father. I have a father. I have an Abba. And the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Please don't give me the vacation Bible school yawn. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. No, people, we're talking about an epic, seismic event. A revolutionary event. Where whatever you were called, and whatever name has been put on you, and whatever name you put on yourself, through the work of Christ and your faith in him, the spirit of God invades our lives and now testifies with our spirit. I've got an identity, okay? I have an identity. And do you know what it is? It is that I am a daughter of almighty God. That's who I am. I am a son of almighty God. God, I have a perfect father and I am a perfectly loved son, a perfectly loved daughter. That's the ID and that's the root system out of which I want to grow up and live out my life because we're going to live out of whatever ID we embrace for our lives. And you just said there's a new ID today. Maybe you are a superstar. Hope you are. But man, if that's your ID, you are in for a bumpy ride. Your ID is not superstar. Your ID is that you are a son. Maybe you are depressed. It's real. But it is not your ID. Your ID is prized daughter of a king. Maybe you are the CEO, but that's not your ID. Your identity, Mrs. CEO, Mr. CEO, I'm a daughter of Almighty God. I'm a son of the King of the Ages. That is who I am. I am not a failure. 
And I'm really not a success either. I'm a son. I'm a daughter. I'm not deficient nor defective. I am not a reject or incidental. I am not the accumulation of my wealth or my accomplishments. And I'm not what other people say I am, whether they say I'm pretty or not, or tall or thin, or short or a little overweight, or whether I look good or don't look good, or I have this or I have that. I'm not that. I'm not the sum total of other people's opinions or the accumulation of likes or comments. I am a brand new creation in Christ. And you know what? I am free and chosen and holy and loved. And I am a son. I am in a family. I've got a seat at a table. I am with God and God is with me. I'm a part of a story. Just a little stone but I'm in a big, big stone with a big story with a big, big rock and God has prophesied over me. He has spoken over me. He has chosen me and appointed me and defined me and accepted me and invited me in to a grand story, a story so great the gates of Hades will not prevail against the story that God has invited me in. I am not perfect yet. I am still gonna make some mistakes, but God has prophesied over my life to rise up. Are you listening, little rock? I wanna put you in the story today. Are you listening? I want to free you today. Are you listening? I want to heal you today and set you free from every label and every name except the name loved daughter. Loved son. And if it's not loved son of the most high, push it off to the side and embrace the words that can change everything. I am who you say. I am, and I'm willing to humble myself and embrace those words and breathe them in and live them out to the glory of the Father who brought me to life as a son.